watching individuals, adventurous, daring, intrepid individuals go through life spoke to me of a, of a huge moral need to restore their function. Hello, I'm Emmy DeGrappa. Each week, we bring you stories asking our guest the question, why? We learn about their passion, why they do what they do, why should we care, and what can we learn? What better place to explore the human landscape than from the state known for its incredible landscapes, Wyoming? And what better organization than Wyoming Humanities? Serving our state for over 45 years, we share stories, ideas, and wisdom about the human experience. This is What's Your Why? Today, we are talking to Dr. Chris Duncan. His research is focused on the restoration of movement and sensation for amputees through the development of advanced neuroprosthetics that can tap into and communicate with the nerves and muscles. Welcome, Dr. Duncan. Thank you. It's great to be here. As a doctor, how did you become impassioned with helping amputees? I am a subspecialist trained in physical medicine and rehabilitation. It's a type of medicine that deals with people who have more or less incurable diseases. Amputation is unfortunately one of those because we cannot regrow limbs and will not for our lifetimes, most likely. Watching individuals, adventurous, daring, intrepid individuals go through life with a seemingly minor impairment of not being able to tie a shoe or to do other tasks was uh, spoke to me of a of a huge moral need to restore their function. That is how I got into it. My dissatisfaction with existing technologies and their application, uh, and the inability to imagine what would truly be possible should we have adequate tools, bothered me tremendously. Um, so I feel like there was a great moral need to develop technology for these individuals. What do you think about current prosthetics when you said they're inadequate? In what way are they inadequate? Current prosthetics and the process behind getting payment for them is crippling. Losing one arm is not so bad. Most people can get by with one-handed tasks and make adjustments. Losing two hands, however, is very difficult to do two-handed tasks like dressing, bathing, brushing your teeth, etc., As it stands, um, reimbursement only cares about dressing, bathing, grooming, some toileting, but that does not adequately express what people want to do with their life and where they find fulfillment. To that end, then, I think we have to restore hand function, right? There's nothing short of hand function, so a hook is not great. I have a patient that likes to change her daughter's diapers. She's missing both arms. It's very challenging with a hook uh, for both parties. The inability to sense where skin is soft and where the diaper begins is impossible. So it's all done visually. Um, it's like it's like trying to do that with a, a set of chopsticks, more or less. In new robotic hands move each have motors to move each finger individually, but there is no control strategy to move them in a way where our hands move naturally and flexibly, right? So spontaneously we can make an AOK sign or a fist or pick up a set of keys, right? Effortlessly, that's what we intend to do. We try to create effortless, uh, intuitive movement algorithms through computers interpreting electrical signals of the arm and nerve. And so what is the new technology that changes that? What, What do you have to make happen inside somebody's body for them to have sensations? There's a, a synergy of different technologies. One is the ability to implant electrodes, which listen to minute electrical changes in the muscle and in the nerve to be able to divine what, what um, a person was intending. And then we correlate a training performance with, with actual electrical signals, and then b- people are able to move in a naturalistic pattern. For sensation, the reverse is true, right? Where they, a sensor on a prosthetic hand is activated uh, the computer interprets that and converts it to the natural language of the nerve, which is a frequency encoded 
a language and then uh, signal is picked up by the existing peripheral nerve at the end where it was cut off or wherever our, our nerve implants are implanted, it travels up the nerve to the spinal cord into the brain to the usual locations that you would perceive pressure, vibration, touch. In every effort, we try to mimic them so that they're called biofidelic, meaning that they strive to have the quality of normal touch. Does your work and your science change when you're working with like a newborn baby that's born without a limb versus an adult who got in a, a serious accident and lost a limb. Does, does the technology change for that? Absolutely, right? We have not worked with children that young. We have worked with freshmen, freshmen in college, is our youngest that we've worked with, who are missing both arms. And what's remarkable about that is it is that in 15 minutes time, they're able to control a hand and a wrist and fingers, even never having controlled the concept of a hand in their mind, right? Their arms end above their elbows. So from even just a neuroscience perspective, that is a huge breakthrough to understand how rapid we can control something uh, as, as difficult mechanically as a hand. And that suggests that we are hardwired from birth to be able to control hands. So that brings another question, because is the person that you're working with, this this young person, they were born without arms. Yes. They never experienced ever the sensation of having fingers in their whole life. That's correct. And I, I wonder, does that change when someone who's had that sensation and then no longer has it? You know, what, what about the phantom hand how does that fit into it? Phantom sensation and its painful correlate, phantom limb pain, occur in traumatic amputees. Um, they h hardly ever occurs if you're born without a limb. We envision, though, for those born without limbs to be able to, much like in the deaf community, where cochlear implants are, are fairly controversial early on because of their cultural implications, we don't think that there's a, a cultural of uh, is a similar culture to contend with. We would like to enable children at a young age to have a wireless interface, reading their nerves and their muscles, to be able to extend their body in novel ways, not just to prosthetic hands, but to all kinds of user interfaces, which may include computers, automotive applications, and many other ways. So you just see this being as groundbreaking. Are there other people throughout the country doing this research? There are. There are a number of institutions in the, in the United States. Uh, we are probably one of, one of three at this level. I think everybody's hope is to remove the limitations that, that fate has uh, unfairly bestowed upon these children or upon individuals that happen to have a traumatic accident. It's in some measure trying to level the playing field. So that's why you call it um, a moral obligation. I believe so. And as a doctor, is there kind of a controversy about what doctors feel as being um, a moral obligation or not? Do you feel that there's like maybe some coldness? Maybe there's, it, this is your passion, but maybe not all people feel that way. Or maybe not, not all people in the medical field feel that way. The bar for good enough changes, and it's a cultural manifestation of our thoughts, hopes, and beliefs culturally, right? And I can't help but notice, right, in, in popular science fiction culture, right, the prevalence of prosthetic arms and the merge of mind and machine, right? I think that speaks to our interest in restoring broken bodies to the best state possible. Financial constraints will forever remain a problem, right, um, as alluded to by the $6 million man in Steve Austin. $6 million is a good ballpark. Uh, really? <laughs> for the latest cutting edge research that at uh, multiple levels, but that's a digression. But actually, it's not a digression because then, then what you're saying is that though this technology is out there and this research is being done, who can afford it? Uh, so William Gibson, a sci-fi writer, writes, the future is already here, and I may be misquoting, but the future is already here. It's just unequally distributed. And unfortunately, we have to decide how much equity we want to be able to parse out in terms of opportunity and cost. Individuals that we restore to full function should be able to return to work 
should be able to lead productive lives unencumbered by, say, you know, being born due to a birth defect from a pill, a medication, or a birth trauma. I think that's an ideal world and one that I, I strive to make. Right, but your research must cost millions of dollars. Who who funds that research? So I am a small part of a collaborative team at the University of Utah. There is a, an accomplished surgeon, Doug Hutchinson, uh, an orthopedist and specializes in hand surgery that does most of the implants. The primary investigator is Greg uh, Clark, uh, a renowned um, scientist. And a, we have a horde of graduate students and postdocs that assist us with um, these breakthroughs. So I, I don't want to claim undue credit, but it's a collaborative approach. It's necessarily that that way because it's complex and because we interface with humans. The grants come from the Department of Defense, uh, from DARPA, um, who has been an exceptional collaborator to work with from a funding perspective because of their interest on bringing this to market in a realistic way. Um, National Science Foundation, uh, as well as some other smaller private grants. This, this is a vision worth having. Our military sees that for a plethora of good reasons. Absolutely. And I, and I think that when you bring it to market, maybe that will help make it affordable to people. The, the affordability will come. First generation devices, will be necessarily expensive. But one of the, the uh, different healthcare spheres are able to provide for patients at a different level. I have the opportunity to work at the Salt Lake City Veterans Hospital and provide prosthetic needs, prosthetic solutions for those with limb loss. And there we are not constrained by cost, but really only answer to patient need, right? Which is in keeping with the mission of the Veterans Hospital to restore those that have given so much for our country. Um, in the private sector, insurers want to know uh, that they're getting bang for their buck. Historically, upper limb prosthetics, especially if you're just missing one hand, have been less than successful with, up to rates, uh, with rates of up to 50% abandonment after one year because patients felt that the devices weren't helpful to them. So that seems very indicting to me and suggests that we need a whole new phase of technology that is useful to them. So for those reasons, we invite focus groups in, we spend a fair amount of time in surveys and with real people. Well, and I like the way you explained how beautiful the hand is and to put a prosthetic that looks like a hook on someone who actually has the functionality of a hand, which is so complex and just even aesthetically doesn't make sense. So I, I, I appreciate how you took that and made that part of your moral dilemma. Yeah. Unfortunately, payers, those that would provide payment for medical services, have adopted a strategy from the pharmaceutical industry called step therapy, where you start with a cheaper alternative and see whether or not it fails, and then only escalate in price and efficacy, which has proven detrimental because you give somebody subpar equipment and you predispose them to do not as well. An interesting anecdote is that in Europe, the hook is, is not widely used. It's considered kind of uh, an, an ugly anathema. Uh, in the United States, we have a different culture and we're more functional. Uh, and so we employ it more often. It's a little bit more robust. It's reliable. Um, these newer hands, the primary complaint among all my patients is that the robotic hands break far too frequently and the return time is so long as to kind of make it not worth it. Oh, they can't wow. depend on it. Right, right. So that's another mountain you have to climb. Durability. Durability. <laughs> Think of all the gloves you've gone through in your life. Think of the wear and tear on the doorknobs in your house. You've worn brass off with your bare hands. Right, right. That's a really good point. What great work. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's a, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of What's Your Why? A production of Think Why Wyoming Humanities. 
This has been executive producer Emmy DeGrappa. Please subscribe and never miss a show. For more information, go to thinkwhy.org.